Okay, let's continue. So culture is adoptive and we can adopt from the cultures that we are associated. And uh, culture has a distinct entity and culture has its uh, utility and uh, culture is gratifying. Having said that, so what happened? It's not moving. Yeah. So, what makes up a culture is how the culture comes up. So sociologists see culture as consisting of two different categories. Material culture related to any physical object to which we give social meaning and symbolic culture. The ideas associated with the cultural group. Two different types. One is a material culture and then a symbolic culture. Particularly material culture includes the objects associated with a cultural group such as tools, machines, utensils, buildings, and artwork. You know, even the um, utensils that we use help the individuals to understand our culture. These archaeologists, um, uh, when they start digging here and there, they find some utensils of the ancient days. Through those utensils, they try to understand the culture of that period. So all of these are essential, material culture and then symbolic culture. Symbolic culture in includes ways of thinking. So the ways of thinking in uh, as the amalgamation of these beliefs, values, and assumptions, and ways of behaving, norms, interactions, and communication. You know, different cultures, we find different ways of communicating, particularly in Indian culture. No communication, mostly we have a non-verbal communication. So when somebody comes and asks, uh, do you need, um, do you want a cup of key, coffee? Said, yes. We don't speak much. Yes. We use like this. It means yes. And we call them this, come, come. A lot of just, gestures we use and uh, postures use, we use to communicate. But every culture will have their own way of communicating. These gestures and postures in other cultures may have a different meaning. So in a Western culture, these ways of, uh, if you say, this, this, when they ask, do you need a cup of coffee? If you don't talk, if you say like this, you can, they, they don't understand because that's not the way that they communicate. So the symbolic culture, you know, we have all this. So, the meaning of this red light depends on the context. No, you don't need to have a big board or anything. So the meaning of this red light have a different ways of understanding. If it is in the four corners, a red light, you understand that culture communicates. Yes, you need to stop your vehicle. And if you have a different type of red light there, you know, you understand the place for red lights, prostitutes area and uh, police having a red light. So the, it's a way of culture. Uh, uh, the, the color gives a different meaning in different contexts, different places. So, so components of culture. One of the most important functions of symbolic culture is it allows us to communicate through signs, gestures, and language. As I already said, signs, 
you know even the children in the school if they say them like this they have some they are communicating something to teacher if they said this they communicate something and um, uh, different ways of communicating this non verbal communication signs gestures and you know, um my son little little boy six years old boy if he is angry he will go to some corner and sit stiffly sit just like that he sits like this then he communicating his gesture help us to understand that he is communicating something even the language I know these are all cultural ways of doing it. If I am happy with an individual, um, we just politely call hello. If we are angry, hello. You know, the, the ways that we communicate, signs or symbols such as traffic signals, as I said, um, a product logo. You know, even a small logo communicates so much. Even my coach institute has its own logo on it. It communicates so much. it's a, it's a part of the culture or used to meaningfully represent something else gestures are the signs that we make with our body such as head gestures you know we say like this no 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 yes yes no we have a different ways of uh, account these are all cultural ways of communication you know western culture they don't have gestures with the head and no they don't, they never knew they say yes or no verbally but we say no means mm -hmm. yes means like this so we have the, the gestures or the signs that we make with our body such as hand gestures and the facial expressions it is important that these gestures also carry meaning also carry meaning components of culture as we continue to see finally language a system of communication using vocal sounds gestures and written symbols is probably the most significant component of culture because it allows us to communicate you now the language allows us to communicate because language is one of the important component in culture because language has a great significant impact on culture language is so important that many have argued that it shapes not only our communication but our perceptions of how we see things as we well recently last week the central government of india uh, brought a new educational policy saying that all the children till fifth grade they have to learn in vernacular language because in vernacular language obviously children thinking level will be high uh, because the mother tongue plays a vital role some of the countries like korea and japan uh, they still give a lot of priority to the mother tongue by the way the theology has been really uh, developed by german theologians even now if you need to study any theology the bull bultmann or whatever not all the, theolo the, the theological textbooks are written in germany now we have to learn german german theologians play a vital role they have written in english they wrote only in germany but still now we have to learn germany to be a good theologian and uh, understand the background and the context of the theological concepts so language is so important that many have argued that it shapes not only our communication but our perception of perceptions of how we see things as well so language is very very essential Comp and the sapphire wolf hypothesis uh, which is the idea that language structures thought and that ways of looking at the world are embedded in language supports this premises so snow jam family guy and on all these uh, some sort of uh, terminologies that we use how do we understand unless we taste unless we see so these are all um, uh, the components in the language we explain this is snow yeah how do you understand this is snow it is a language that says yeah when you see this 
we have given a code saying that there is a snow. Then only the child fix it in the mind. We say this bottle is a jam. If this is a guy. You know, these are a language plays a vital role to this cognitive mind to understand the objects. You know, the mind fixes this is money. You know, so the language plays a vital role in culture. So importance of language. Language facilitates culture. No, language is the key component in culture. Language facilitates culture. Is American English the same and British English code? No, not at all. It says C O L O U R, the British English. American English says you remove the U. C O L O R. You know, sometimes we really struggle even in pronunciation. Um, so the language plays a vital role in culture. Where would you find eggplant in the grocery store? Eggplant. So cheese plus hamburger, cheese hamburger. Lettuce plus hamburger, lettuce burger. So these are all a kind of a Western cultural context. We may not know all that much, some of us. Of course, we know now because of the so much influence from the West. We know all these cheese, hamburger, and all those things. So values, shared beliefs about what a group considers with worthwhile are desirable. Guide the creation of norms, the formal and informal rules regarding what kinds of behavior are acceptable and appropriate within a culture. Norms given are behavior. You know, even in our Indian cultural context, we have norms. We have a bit behavior patterns. So norms are specific to a culture, time period, and situation. Norms can be either formal, such as a law, a common type of formally defined norm that provides an explicit statement about what is permissible and what is illegal in a society. I work in a uh, school, uh, a seminary, as a director, and um, this old man, still <laughs> very funny, the Northeast uh, girls, they never knew what is sari, particularly Northeast uh, girls, they wear only different types of dresses, they never knew how to wear sari. But in this Bible school, sari is compulsory. These little these children they struggle to understand how to wear and don't even they wear the saris and come to class and they go. We see the struggle, uh, the fear and the anxiety when they walk. But they're kind of a norm, a law in the college saying everybody should wear a sari, but inside a lot of filth and a lot of sexual perversion, but outside they want only sari. And another norm, nobody should wear zin pant. It's very funny to see. There's a norm and the law outside. These are all a kind of external. Um, the, the culture sometimes imposes all these external things. The Christian culture. I know you need to sit only this way. You need to wear, the, wear this dress. You need to speak only this. And even the Hindu culture or maybe in a society, every society will have their own norms. Are the rules for playing Sucker are informal, which are not written down and are unspoken. So unspoken norms are there in our society. And particularly, you know, we have so many of these norms and unspoken uh, rules and regulations. You know, as I say, if you, if you eat this banana, this will happen. The people are so, such a funny norms are there. You know, you should not um, eat ghee if you get a, you will get a cough, which is not really true. And uh, don't take a card, you will get a cold. This is, you know, these are all such kind of funny norms and the laws have come in a hidden form. So types of norms can also be distinguished by the strictness with which they are enforced. The strictness that is enforced and even we see them in the family, in the society, in the church, in the temple or in an office. A hidden norms. And there, particularly in an Indian context, we have these hidden norms. Uh, the, of course, even now, some traditional families, they do practice. If the father-in-law is there, daughter-in-law should not walk in front of that place, or maybe it should not come when a guest comes. Uh, 
the the wife should not come to the drawing uh, hall or maybe give you know there are so many hidden norms uh, the a folkway is a loosely enforced norm that involves common customs practices or procedures that ensure smooth social interaction and acceptance some of these folk way of uh, these norms are very good the society runs with that uh, society rules and regulations i think i am posting a book on um, a f uh, an understanding folk religion written by oh, what is the name uh, i'll tell you when i remember um, I'm just not getting this name. I'm posting that book. You should read that. So uh, a more more ray is a norm that carries greater moral significance is closely related to the core values of a group and often involves severe repress uh, this repression for violators. A taboo is a norm and reigns so deeply that even thinking about violating is evokes strong feelings of disgust, horror, or uh, revulsion for most people. You know, in any culture, we see these taboos. These taboos we need to understand to get into that culture, particularly in a tribal culture and in uh, some folk uh, cultural context, we have these taboos. What are those, even in a Hindu cultural context, we have so many taboos. They're associated with the superstitious beliefs and practices. Sanctions are positive or negative. Reactions to the ways that people follow are disobey norms, including rewards for conformity and punishment for Norm violators. You know, when these people violate these norms, they get punishments. Sanctions help to establish social control. The formal and informal mechanisms used to increase conformity to values and norms and thus increase social co cohesion. So, as we continue to understand the culture, as we look at the culture, sociologists who study culture often focus on their own cultures. Some sociologists, however, engage in the process of othering by studying unusual, extraordinary, or deviant cultural groups. So these are all sociological perspective. As we look at these technical words, we need to understand ways of looking at the culture. We have been trying to understand what is culture, the norm, the taboos, and all those things, uh, different types of cultures. But now we get into the ways of looking at the culture, you and I, how we look at. Number one, ethnocentrism. You need to Google and read more on this. Some of the books that I'm giving, they explain more on ethnocentrism. Either uh, any one of us, uh, we fall into any one of these uh, uh, ways of looking at the culture. Mostly, uh, the Western Christianity falls into this ethnocentrism. What is ethnocentrism? It is the principle of using one's own culture as a standard by which to evaluate another group or individual, leading to the view that cultures other than one's own are abnormal. Cultures other than one's own are abnormal. Hope you got my point. Cultures other than my church are abnormal. Sometimes I feel though my brother boxing church culture is the perfect culture. Others are abnormal. No, 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 they are not really, they don't, they, they, they don't know, they are cultureless. No, my Christian culture is the perfect because it has directly come from there from the West, mostly. 80% of Christian culture has come from the West. The perfect. And what is there in Indian culture is the demonic. More, everything is demonic. Let's throw out everything. So even my caste culture, sometimes no, this is such a uh, demonic uh, possession is very much in India. The caste is directly from the demon. 
the caste culture you know my caste the forward caste or a backward caste or a dalit caste everybody is caste oriented even the christians are more caste consciousness people i thought before coming to christianity i i don't know before knowing christ only as a hindu boy i hate caste, caste consciousness because i have seen my relatives family everybody practicing it i hate it caste caste consciousness but when i became a believer i see more caste consciousness even in christianity so my own caste within the dalit caste there is a sub caste my own caste culture uh, is greater than the other culture culture other than one's own is abnama who wants a snake many way those are in a western context cultural relativism that is a cultural ethnocentrism says that my culture is greater and yours all is demonic and maybe not at all up to the mark and the second thing is cultural relativism what is cultural relativism do you remember from the beginning i've been telling any extreme is devilish cs lewis said devil brings pairs you know extremisms this is another extreme cultural relativism is the principle of understanding other cultures on their own terms rather than judging according to one's own culture it's not accepting every culture all cultures are good yours is good mine is good everything is good particularly post modern thinking is this relativism everything is good there is no absolute values you know everything is right you know in your culture sati is right in my culture this is right and in your culture bribing is right because today in particular in asian context uh, especially in india bribing has come into a cultural context it became a culture now even christian community the christian um, uh, nominal christians and even some believers also bribing is a part of their life and particularly my mission leaders are uh, most of bribing people you no know, they, they, they exercise bribing directly or indirectly call me per privately i will talk to you if you really need examples when studying any group it is important to try to employ cultural relativism because it helps sociologists to see others more objectively you know in one point this is good in one way cultural relativism is good but if you go deep um if you really open all the doors for this you know you lose the exclusiveness of a biblical culture Uh, it leads to a kind of syncretistic practices so when studying a group particularly if you are going to a, a hindu group initially to study yes we need to have this relative understanding cultural relativism it is important to try to em employ cultural relativism because it helps sociologists to see others more objectively but there is a danger in it and now variety in culture as we continue to see although much research focuses on the differences between cultures there is also tremendous tremendous uh, variation within a culture multiculturalism we have seen ethnocentrism cultural relativism and now we see multiculturalism values diverse racial ethnic national and linguistic backgrounds and so encourages the reaction of cultural differences within society rather than assimilation we are closing the dominant culture refers to the values norms and practices of the group within society that is most powerful in terms of wealth prestige status and influence a subculture is a group within society that is differentiated by its distinctive values norms and lifestyle dominant culture subculture and then counterculture a counterculture is a group within society that openly rejects and or actively opposes society's values and norms this is a counter culture we are going to study all of them from the biblical perspective mainstream culture is often characterized by points of 
dissension and division, which are sometimes called culture wars. You know, you have seen uh, nations after nations having wars, but there is a cultural wars that happened in the history, and now it's happening in India also. Culture wars. Sociologists also make a distinction between norms and values are more aspired to idle culture than actually practiced real culture. Idle culture, real culture, you may be hearing so many technical words, don't worry about it, you keep on read, you'll understand. High culture is distinguished from low culture based on the characteristics of their audience, not on characteristics of their cultural objects. Now here, culture needs an audience to listen to their way of uh, uh, perceptions, perceptions, and their way of uh, uh, explaining the terms. High culture refers to those forms of culture usually associated with the elite or dominant classes. Even in Indian culture, Indian context, we see the forward caste, high caste community, the the uh, the, the, the country as a uh, as a na as a nation, as a people, think oh that's a high that's a high culture, great culture, those who are in the hierarchy, the affluent society. Why Western culture is so prominent across the globe? Because of the, uh, the, the high culture, the high class, superpower, and why a kind of a Brahminical culture in India is uh, looked at as a superior because of the status. Here status, socio-political, economic status, decides what is high culture and low culture. Why the uh, poor uh, tribal or uh, Dalit culture is very low, inferior. Of course, they are in the mud, uh, they, are, they play with the animals and you know they live with the animals, but you know, sometimes that's the rich culture. You know, having uh, not having a upper cloth, that's their culture, that is the rich for them, that's a high culture for them. But we look at them as in a low culture. But even the high class, you know, the, the affluent society can have a sleeveless and you know, law, even a kind of half naked. That's a high culture today. You know, the Western culture has imported all these kind of things. But that is in a high profile culture. But the poor guys who don't have money to buy clothes and then all the time living in the forest and the, here and they're struggling with the minimum clothes they wear. Of course, they are also wearing the same color dress. But this is looked as a low culture. Here, a culture um, uh, is manipulated. The people manipulate the culture. It depends on the high class. Popular culture refers to the forms of cultural expression, usually associated with the masses, consumer good, and consumer products. You know, you see the most of the advertisements uh, they they give this popular culture. You know, the consumer consumerism, consumer culture. You know, a dil mange more. This heart wants more and more. Today we have this culture, consumer culture, and the culture change. Tomorrow we talk about this culture change. Cultures usually change slowly and incrementally, though change can also happen in rapid and dynamic ways. But slowly it brings change. One of the key ways that material culture can change is through technology. <coughs> through technology and today technology changed our culture our way of dress we have eating we have talking we have respecting we have family life what not everything the technology is controlling our culture so we stop it here today and then tomorrow we pick up from here cultural imperialism uh, we continue from here today let me stop it here and um, uh, We go for a discussion about five, 10 minutes and then we can conclude today's lecture. Okay, any doubts or any concerns for us to pray and conclude?